join Bishop Arthur Embrasier and the Apostolic Church of God as we praise and worship the Lord together. Our pastor, Pastor Byron Brazier, Pastor Emeritus Bishop Arthur M. Brazier, Senator Barack Obama. happy to be in the house of the Lord one more time, someone should shout hallelujah. hallelujah. If you're happy to be in the house of the Lord one more time, someone should shout thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a special day that we have where we acknowledge the senator from the state of Illinois, Senator Barack Obama. We're also thankful for his wife, uh, Michelle Obama, and her children. thankful that they've come to worship with us because our mission has not changed. We come to worship the Lord today. Now let's give God praise. So we pray for our country. Pray for our community. We pray for the one standing next to you. Because we don't know what issue they may have. We pray for them as well. Because prayer changes things. At this time, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come giving honor, glory, and thanks. First for 
being the God of our salvation. We thank you because you have allowed your grace and your mercy to rest and abide in us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us into all truth. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your blessings you've bestowed upon us day after day after day. And so as we look to you on this day, we come into worship presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless this service, that you will bless our speaker, that you will bless the choir, but most that you will bless this congregation as we go forward in your precious name, that you will bless those to the left and to the right, those who are behind, those who are above, those who are in the other sanctuary and in other parts of the building. Lord, we ask that you extend your mercy upon each and every one of us and allow us new opportunities to call on your name and to serve you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for our pastor emeritus, Bishop Brazier. We ask, O oh Lord, you continue to give him long life, health, and strength. We do honor him and we do honor you on this day. And we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let the church say amen. amen. Scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Let us all read together. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asap is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And this is the word of the Lord. We bless the Lord this morning for the reading of his word, our congregational song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. If the redeemed will be there when the roll is called, let them say hallelujah. hallelujah. You may be seated in the sanctuary in the presence of our God.
thank the Lord for our choir on this morning. And as we proceed, there, there are uh, two presentations to be made to our pastor, the Emeritus Bishop Brazier. One is going to be made by our children's church. Uh, we're going to ask Dr. Martin to come. And then after that, I've asked Bishop Brazier uh, to have words uh, of his own choosing uh, concerning the senator who he has known for many years and has a very dear and close relationship with both the senator and his wife, Michelle. And so I've asked Bishop Brazier to have remarks as well after he receives uh, these presentations. This time, uh, Dr. Martin. We want to thank you on behalf of the Children's Church of the Apostolic Church. Uh, we have two young men who want to give a presentation, a trilogy, to the bishop in honor of Father's Day. Good morning, Bishop Brazier. My name is Marcel, Movi Marcellus Stewart IV, and I am here on behalf of Children's Church. Bishop Brazier, we are presenting you with the Trilogy of Honor. With your retirement, one book is just not enough. We hope that you enjoy the first book so much that you cannot wait to read the second and third as you read. <laughs> as you read as you relax in a comfy chair and enjoy retirement. We love you, Bishop Brazier. Happy Father's Day. Praise the Lord, giving glory and honor to God and to Bishop Brazier, our new pastor, Dr. Byron Brazier. Bishop, we love you. And we have felt so many years, 46 to be exact, that the willing workers have tried to give you and Sister Brazier encouragement and love. So we want to honor you today by saying Happy Father's Day. Will all the willing workers please stand up, please? And we want to give honor to you, Bishop, for all these years. God bless you. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank the Children's Church for their trilogy uh, of books that they are, they are giving me. The first one I will read with delight, and we'll be looking forward to the second and to the third. <laughs> I am very happy to see my dear friend, uh, Allison Davis, and his family, and their beautiful daughter. I have for them to stand, please. And uh, my good friend all the way from South Africa, R Brother Ronald Gault. And my daughter all the way from Georgia, Roz. <laughs> She's here for Father's Day. And of course, all the members of my family and others who here who I love deeply. But I am uh, overjoyed to have just a brief word uh, about my good friend, uh, Senator uh, Barack Obama, who has changed the course of America. He is a man who loves people and who has given uh, his, all of his adult life 
to helping people. He is concerned about the poor, and he is concerned about the working man, the people who have to get up every day uh, in the rain, in the snow, uh, in the heat and in the cold to go out and make a living in what we call middle-class America. Uh, that's where his heart is. Uh, he is a man uh, who is a true patriot. And he has done something uh, in this country that uh, I never thought I would live to see. Uh, and I am, I, I, am, I, am, I am filled with emotion because uh, I have lived through some very tough times in America. Uh, but the America today is not the America of yesteryear. And I don't, think it's going to, I don't think it behooves us well to keep talking about the past. The Apostle Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out to the things that are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus. Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King, on the night before his death, he said, children, I see the promised land. He said, you're going to reach the promised land. He said, I may not get there with you, but you're going to reach the promised land. I can tell you now that America, we in America, have crossed over the River Jordan. We are out of the wilderness, and we are in the promised land. Now, now let's forget about let's let's forget about the milk and the honey. Yeah. Let's forget about the grapes and the pomegranants. Yeah. All that is in the promised land and it is there. But when the children of Israel crossed over, they didn't cross over to rest. They didn't cross over to enjoy. They crossed over to begin the struggle. And so the promised land is not heaven. The promised land is not all ease. The struggle still goes on. America is a great country. I love this country. I have always done so. But before I take my seat, I want to say a word about a beautiful woman without whose help Senator Obama may not even be here. I'm talking about Michelle Obama. An outstanding woman, a true patriot. I've known both of them for years and they love their country and they have been responsible for a monumental sea change in America. And we thank God for you, Michelle, and we thank God for those two beautiful young ladies, your, your, your daughters, who are with you today. We are happy. It's a great joy in all of our hearts and we thank God for you and our senator. May God bless you, and thank you very much. Amen, amen, amen. Before we lift our offering, I just want to take this opportunity to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Happy Father's Day. This is a great day, it's a great day, because fathers, men, are the backbone of our community. Men, fathers of this church. We have over 6,000 men that are members of this church, and we thank the Lord for each and every one of them. And the Lord has blessed us, not just to be men, but to be shepherds of our house. 
There can only be one shepherd of a house. Just one. It is not a shared responsibility. It's a shepherd. And our men are shepherds of their home. We believe in making sure that our home and our families are taken care of. And many times people don't say, well, you know, what's the difference? They say, you know, we're the, you know they, we talk about, you know, we're the head. But see, head doesn't have a job description. That's a position. It's shepherd that is most important. And what I've told men, I'll tell all the ladies today, what I've told the men as we've gone on retreats, I said, you're the shepherd, which means when you come home, you inspect your flock. You inspect your wife as to the wounds the world has put on them, including the ones we have done. And then you pull out your oil and you make sure that you tend to those wounds. And then you go back to inspect and make sure they're all gone and they're healed. And that's what shepherds do. The men of this church are shepherds. We take care of the flock. The scripture says that Jesus was king of king and lord of lords. But Jesus said of himself, I am the good shepherd. And even after all that is done, we know that as the head of our homes, we watch over and make sure that all things are taken care of. Last month, Bishop talked about the mothers, about all that mothers have done. He said, I'm not going to talk about the fathers. So he just lifted up the mothers and praised the mothers. And many times, Bishop gives us the story about the lioness who goes out and they hunt. And they bring back the food. They're the ones that do all that. And they bring back the food. And then the old male lion takes his first share. But I'm here to tell you that that old lion makes sure that the lioness is safe while they're doing their hunting. And at any time there's an attack on the pride, it is that thousand pound monster that stands up to protect all that belongs to him. So men, we may not be able to say, well, men do this, men do this, men do this. But men, we take care of our homes. We take care of our house. We are the shepherds of our house. And so to all the men, happy Father's Day. And let me say this last thing. It, it is not, I am 58 years old and many people are 58 cannot look at their father and say, Happy Father's Day. So today I will turn and look at my father and say, Happy Father's Day. It is now offering time at the Apostolic Church of God. The Lord has been good. Give as the Lord has prospered you. We are a tithing church. The work of the ministry goes forward because of our tithes and our offerings. So as you give, give because the Lord has already blessed you, not because you're seeking some other blessing or some new blessing. He woke you up this morning. He started you on your way. And we wake up thanking the Lord. We wake up saying, Lord, I just thank you for this day. And so as the basket passes, as you drop your envelope in or your loose change, just say thank you. Lord, I just thank you for what you've done. And when we give him thanks, he'll open up the windows of heaven and he'll pour us out a blessing we won't, we'll not be able to receive. So our psalmist today, Sister Elizabeth Norman and Brother Keel Williams. To those in the Kenwood Sanctuary, I'm not coming over to greet you and the banquet hall, I'm not coming over to greet you, but I wanted to take this opportunity to say, we, we may be divided by walls, but we're not divided by spirit. And so to each and every one of you, we're thankful that 
You've chosen to worship here for those who are visitors and for those who are members. The Lord has blessed us to be in this place, and we're thankful to him. Amen? Amen. This time, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come giving honor, glory, and thanks. It was such a wonderful time that we have of worship and giving back to you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will bless us as we give. That we'll give humbly. and That we will give graciously and from the bottom of our hearts. And we pray that you will bless this offering and that you will sanctify it for the use and the work of the ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ushers, please come forward. Just as we go, Lord, help us to be wise in times when we don't know. Let this be our prayer when we lose. with your grace give us faith so we'll be safe I pray we'll find your light and hold it in our hearts when stars go out each night, Lord, they'll know where you are. Let this be your prayer. When shadows fill our day. Us to a place, guide us with your grace, give us faith so we'll be safe. Sonia Monmando, senza blu violenza, un mondo di. Guide 
us with your grace. Give us faith so we'll be saved. of the living God I extol you and I adore you dear Jesus oh Jesus you have my praise you have my praise dear Jesus Jesus I extol you, I extol you. 
seems cruel and so unfair. With each new day, it seems a greater problem waiting there. For each step forward I take, seems I get pushed two steps behind. Don't think I'm gonna make it sometimes. Don't think my nerves can take it this time. As I'm about to call it quits, a solution comes to mind. How many know what I'm talking about this morning? Why not trust God again? I know that he can do it if I pray again, believe again, my God will work it for my good again. I know that he will see us through it all. If we just trust God again, oh yeah. Is there a mountain standing in your way? Is there a loved one you're worried about today? Is there a blessing you desire that seems in ten jumbo? Instead of giving up the high to blow, just cling to faith with all your eyes. The God who seen you through before is still there. So sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him and he know what we're talking about this morning there's a storm in your life there's a trial there's a mountain there's some tribulations going on but if you can make that proclamation oh yes I will I will no matter what it looks like no matter how I feel Lord I'll never doubt you
thank the Lord because we can trust him and not trust him one time but trust him over and over again the Lord has been good at this time it gives me a great privilege to introduce our speaker for today He's a man who believes in change. Those of us, those who believe in God, believe in being born again, we know what change is. A new heart will I put, a new spirit will I give you, change. I had a gentleman over who was head of a social service agency once told me, he said, we in the human services business, he said we manage people in their condition. He said if you manage someone in poverty, that's where they stay. He said, but we who know the Lord, the Lord doesn't manage us in our condition. The Lord changes our condition for us to go forward. So without further ado, I bring to you the senator for the state of Illinois, the presumptive candidate of the Democratic Party for President of the United States, Senator Barack Obama. back at Apostolic. Good to be back at Apostolic. Good to be home. Good to be with so many dear friends here in Chicago. There are too many here to mention, but I, as I just look across this wonderful congregation, I'm just reminded of all the wonderful friendships uh, that I have here at Apostolic. Uh, I was talking to Bishop Brazier and 
He said, well, it's a great honor being here. I said, I'm the same young lawyer that helped you get a parking lot. Well, that's, that's all I am. Haven't changed. Haven't changed. Uh, uh, let me, first of all, say to Dr. Byron Brazier and First Lady Mary Brazier, what a, what a blessing it is to see the wonderful, wonderful ministry that you are continuing. To my great friend, Bishop Arthur Brazier, and Sister Isabel Brazier. They have, they have counseled me, they have supported me, they have had my back through thick and through thin. Uh, they have always been there. Bishop Brazier has beat me in tennis. <laughs> but he didn't gloat about it. It was, he was just kind of matter of fact. Uh, everybody knows uh, what a wonderful, wonderful man he is. And so uh, we are so blessed that he is here. Yes. Everybody that's part of the apostolic family and all those who are in the other sanctuary and in the banquet hall, uh, God bless you. I, I'm so grateful for the thoughts and prayers and wonderful messages that I've received from all of you uh, throughout this difficult process. People ask me sometimes, how, how do you manage all this? Folks talking about you on cable. and I said, trust in the Lord. I trust in the Lord. He looks after me. Uh, and I also trust in uh, the best wife that anybody could have, <laughs> Michelle Obama, and the best daughters anybody could have, Malia and Sasha Obama, who put up with me every day. They, they gave me some wonderful Father's Day gifts. Sasha wrote me a poem that was just beautiful. Uh, and and I, I'm grateful that they give me attention on Father's Day because uh, I, I remember one time I, I was teasing Michelle about how on Mother's Day there's a lot of hoopla. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on on Mother's Day. I said, how come Father's Day doesn't seem to be as big as Mother's Day? She said, let me tell you, every day is Father's Day. Every, every day, you're getting away with something. So, you're running for president. Don't talk to me about it. It's good to be home on this Father's Day with my girls and with my wife. And it's an honor to spend some time with all of you today in the house of the Lord. You know, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus closes by saying, whoever hears these words of mine and does them shall be likened to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. It was founded upon a rock. Now here at Apostolic, you're best to worship in a house that's been founded on the rock of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But it's also built on another rock, another foundation, and that rock is Bishop Arthur Brazier. In 48 years, he's built this congregation from just a few hundred to more than 20,000 strong, a congregation that, because of his leadership, has braved the fierce winds and heavy rains of violence and poverty. 
joblessness, and hopelessness. Because of his work and his ministry, there are more graduates and fewer gang members in the neighborhoods of Woodlawn. There are more homes and fewer homeless. There's more community and less chaos because of Bishop Arthur Brazier, because he continued the march of justice that he began at Dr. King's side all those years ago. He's the reason this house has stood tall for half a century. And on this Father's Day, it must make him proud to know that the man now in charge of keeping its foundation strong is his son. And we are so proud of Byron Brazier for the work that he is continuing here at Apostolic. But the, the, the legacy of Bishop Brazier, the story that Byron Brazier is writing here at the church, reminds me on this Father's Day that of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, we are most dependent on the family. The family is that most important foundation. And we are called to recognize and honor how critical every father is to that foundation. They are teachers and coaches, they're mentors and they're role models. They are examples of success and the men who constantly push us towards success. But if we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that too many fathers are also missing. Too many fathers are MIA. Too many fathers are AWOL, missing from too many lives and too many homes. They've abandoned their responsibilities. They're acting like boys instead of men. And the foundations of our family have suffered because of it. You and I know this is true everywhere, but nowhere is it more true than in the African American community. We know that more than half of all black children live in single parent households. Half, a number that's doubled since we were children. We know the statistics that children who grow up with a out of father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime. They're nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They're more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teen parents because the father wasn't in the home. The foundations of our community and our country are weaker because of this. Think about it, how many times over the last year has this city lost a child at the hand of another child? How many times have our hearts stopped in the middle of the night with the sounds of gunshot or sirens? How many teenagers have we seen hanging out on street corners instead of hanging out in the classroom? How many are sitting languishing in prison when they should be working or at least looking for a job? How many in this generation are we willing to lose to poverty or violence or addiction? How many? We can't simply write these problems off to past injustices. Those injustices are real. There's a reason why our families are dis in disrepair, and some of it has to do with a tragic history, but we can't keep on using that as an excuse. Some of it has to do with the failures of our government, and those failures are real, but we can't keep on using that as an excuse. Yes, we need fewer guns in the hands of people who shouldn't have them. Yes, we need more money for our schools and more outstanding teachers in the classroom and more after-school programs for our children. Yes, we need more jobs and more job training and more opportunity in our community. We know all that. That's why I'm running for president of the United States of America. We know we need to bring about change in America. We know that. But the change we need is not just going to come from government. It's not just going to come from a president. It's going to come from us. 
is going to come from each and every one of us. We need families to raise our children. We need fathers to recognize that responsibility doesn't just end at conception. That doesn't just make you a father. What makes you a man is not the ability to have a child. Any fool can have a child. That doesn't make you a father. It's the courage to raise a child that makes you a father. And, and listen to, to all the mothers out there. You need help. You need help. We need to help all those mothers out there who are raising their kids by themselves. The mothers who drop them off at school and go to work and pick them up in the afternoon and work another shift and get dinner and make lunches and pay the bills and fix the house and protect the family and do all the things that a parent is supposed to do. So many women in our community are doing this in a heroic fashion. We're so proud of all those single moms who are out there doing just incredible work but they need support. They shouldn't have to be doing it all by themselves. They need another parent in the home. Their children need another parent in the home. That's what keeps their foundation strong. That's what keeps the foundation of our country strong. And I know what it means to have an absent parent. Yeah, my father wasn't in the house when I was growing up. I have to say my circumstances weren't as tough as they are for many young people today. Because even though my father left us when I was two years old, and I only knew him by the letters he wrote and the stories my family told, I was growing up in Hawaii. Now, Hawaii is not quite as tough as the South Side. I'm just telling the truth. And I had two wonderful grandparents to help my mother. Grandparents from Kansas who poured everything they had uh, into me, uh, helping my mother to raise my sister and me. They worked to teach us about love and respect and the obligations that we have to one another. And I, I have to admit, I messed up more often than I should have, but I got plenty of second chances. And even though we didn't have a lot of money, uh, I had love and, and, and an education, scholarships, they gave me the opportunity to go to some of the best schools in the country. Yeah. See, a lot of children don't get those chances. There's no margin for error in the lives of so many of our children. They've got to have everything going for them. They've got to have mama rooting for them, but they've got to have daddy rooting for them, too. I understand my story is different, but I know the toll that being a single parent took on my mother. How she struggled at times to pay the bills. How she was embarrassed sometimes to go to the store with food stamps because she wanted to make sure that we had enough to eat. How she struggled to give us the things that other kids had. Sometimes I'd come back home, you know, children don't always think about things the right way, and, and I'd complain about how Johnny had this or Jimmy had that. And, and I can only imagine how that made her feel. She struggled to play all the roles that both parents are supposed to play. She had to be the disciplinarian all the time. And I know the toll it took on me, not having a father in the house. The, the, the hole in your heart, when you don't have a, a male figure in the home uh, that can guide you and lead you and, and set a good example for you. So I resolved many years ago that it was my obligation to break the cycle. That if I could do anything in life, I would be a good father to my children. That if I could do anything, I would give them that rock, that foundation on which to build their lives. That would be the greatest gift I could offer them. And I say this knowing that I've been an imperfect father, knowing that I've made mistakes, I'll continue to make more, uh, wishing that I could be a home more for my girls and my wife uh, than I am right now. Uh, I say this knowing all of these things because even though we're all going to be imperfect parents, imperfect fathers, even as we all face difficult circumstances at times in our lives, 
there's still certain lessons we have to strive to live as fathers. Whether we're black or white, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're from the south side or the wealthiest suburbs. The first lesson, I think, that all of us has to embrace is the idea of responsibility. That the, the idea of, of taking responsibility for your actions and taking responsibility for those that you love. And I know of no better example than this than my father-in-law, Michelle's dad, Frazier Robinson. Frazier Robinson, uh, at the age of 30, was stricken with multiple sclerosis. By the time I met him, by the time I knew him, uh, he had to walk with a couple of walkers, a couple of canes, everywhere he went. Uh, and he never went to college because he grew up at a time when there weren't a lot of opportunities. So he worked at a water fil filtration plant downtown, right by a Navy Pier. And he worked there all his life. And he'd have to wake up an hour early because of his disability, an hour earlier than anybody else just to get to work on time. But he never missed a day's work. He never missed his son's basketball games. He never missed his daughter's recitals. He was always there for them. And he always loved them and always rooted for them and inspired them. He took responsibility. He could have used his disability is an excuse. Just like he could have used racism as an excuse for not caring for his children, but he was there all the time. That's a lesson that we have to embrace in our community. Taking responsibility, no matter what the hardships, to be the kind of father that our children need us to be. The second lesson that I've taken is setting an example of excellence for our children. Because if we want to set high expectations for them, we've also got to set some high expectations for ourselves. You know, it's sometimes, you know, it's interesting during this process of running for president, uh, you remember at the beginning, uh, people were wondering, how come he doesn't have all the support in the African American community? You remember that? That was when I wasn't black enough. Now I'm too black. But, you remember that. You remember that picture? <laughs> Y'all remember. And what was interesting was how many people would come up to me and say, oh, oh Barack, we're, we're, we love you, man. We, we're, we're rooting for you. But, but we just don't think that a black man can be elected president. I mean, we had already defeated ourselves before we even started. We didn't set high enough expectations for ourselves. We believe that somebody else can do it, but we can't do it. And that filters down to our children. That filters down to our children. When we set low expectations for ourselves, we set them low for our children. You know, I, I don't, too many parents come and they say, oh, th this child's got a great report card. They got a B, all Bs. I say, all Bs? Is that the highest grade? Is that, is that the best you can do? I thought there was this other grade, an A. It's nice you got a B, but you can get an A. It's great. It's great if you have a job, but you, know, you can get a better job. It's a wonderful thing if you got a better job, but maybe you can own a business and create jobs. It's a wonderful thing if you're married and living in a home with your children. But don't just sit in the house and watch in Sports Center all day. You know, I, I don't know if you guys remember uh, Chris Rock had a routine. He said, so, so, too many of our, our, our men, they're, they're proud, they brag about doing the things they're supposed to do. They say, well, I, I'm not in jail. Well, you're not supposed to be in jail. Don't brag about that. So, so we're glad that you're in the home, but engage your child. So many of our children are growing up in front of the television set, in front of the video games. As fathers and as parents, we've got to spend more time with them and help them with their homework and 
and turn off the TV set once in a while, turn off the video game and, and the remote control and, and read a book to your child. That's how we build that foundation. We know that every, education is everything to our children's future. We know that they will no longer be competing for jobs against people in Indiana or California. They're going to be competing against young people in China and in India, all over the world. And we know that the work and the studying and the levels of education that that's going to require. You know, uh, just this past week, I stopped by an eighth grade graduation uh, for a, a young woman's charter school, wonderful school. And there was all the pomp and all the circumstance, and parents were all bringing flowers. And, and, and I thought to myself, well, th this is nice that we're celebrating, but you know what, this is just the eighth grade. <laughs> you know, when I see sometimes these eighth grade graduations, I want to remind people, now hold on a second. Hey, th this is just eighth grade. So let's not go over the top. Let's not have a huge party. Let's just give them a handshake and tell them, okay, now you're going to ninth grade and then 10th grade then you're going to graduate, then you're going to college, maybe you'll get a PhD, maybe you'll get a law degree, maybe you'll get a, a medical degree. It's just eighth grade. Don't get carried away with that eighth grade graduation. You're supposed to graduate from the eighth grade. It's up to us, as fathers, as parents, to instill this sense of excellence in our children. It's up to us to say to our daughters, don't let the images on television tell you what you're worth. Because I want my daughters to dream without limits and reach for those goals. It's up to us to tell our sons those songs on the radio that glorify violence and, and glorify materialism. That's not going to cut it in my house. In my house, we live to admire and respect achievement and self-respect and hard work and faith. It's up to us to set those high expectations, and that means meeting those expectations ourselves. The third thing we need to do as fathers is pass along the value of empathy to our children. Not sympathy, but empathy. The ability to stand in somebody else's shoes, to look at somebody through their eyes. Sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in us, in me, that we forget about our obligations to other people, to one another. There, there's a culture in our society that says remembering uh, to look out for other people is somehow being soft. We hear that even you know, in our politics in Washington, that it's all about you. Look out for your self-interest. Don't look out for others. You know, our young children, they see that. They see when you're ignoring or mistreating your wife. They see when you're inconsiderate at home, when you're distant, when you're thinking only of yourself. And so it's no surprise we see that behavior on our school, in our schools and on our streets. And that's why we have to teach young people there's nothing weak about being kind. There's nothing weak about being thoughtful. There's nothing weak about being considerate. We gotta teach our children that you're not strong by putting other people down. You're strong by lifting other people up. That's our responsibility and fathers. And by the way, it's a responsibility that extends to Washington. Because if fathers are doing their part here on the South Side or anywhere in the country, if they're taking responsibility seriously for their children and setting high expectations and instilling in them a sense of excellence and and empathy, then our government should meet them halfway. I can't tell you how many fathers during the course of this campaign I've met who are working two, three jobs but still can't provide health insurance for their children. How many fathers who've lost their job and can't fill up the gas tank to go on a job search because of the high price of gas. We should be meeting them halfway. We should be making it easier for fathers who make responsible choices and harder for those who avoid them. We should get rid of the financial penalties we impose on married couples right now and start making sure every dime of child support goes directly to helping children instead of bureaucrats. We should reward, we should reward fathers who pay that child support with job training and job opportunities and 
a larger earned income tax credit that can help them pay the bills. We, could ex we should expand programs where registered nurses visit, register, uh, visit expected and new mothers and help them learn how to care for themselves before the baby's born and what to do after that child is born. Programs that have helped increase fathers' involvement in their children and help improve the prospects of those women and their children's readiness for school. And we should help new families care for their children by expanding maternity and paternity leave. And we should guarantee that every worker gets more paid sick leave so they can stay home to take care of their child without losing their income or their job. We should take all of these steps to build a strong foundation for our children, but we also know that even if we do, even if we meet our obligations as fathers and parents, even if Washington does its part, uh, we're still going to face difficult challenges in our lives. There will still be days of struggle and days of heartache. The rains will come and the winds will blow. And that's why the final lesson we must learn as fathers is also the greatest gift that we can pass on to our children. Uh, the gift of faith and the gift of hope. I'm not talking about an idle hope that is little more than blind optimism or willful ignorance of the promises that we face. I'm talking about hope and faith inside us that insists, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that something better is waiting for us. If we're willing to work for it, if we're willing to fight for it, if we're willing to believe in it. You know, I was answering questions at a town hall meeting in Wisconsin this week, and a young man raised his hand and he says to me, uh, I, I thought he was going to ask about college tuition or uh, energy or the war in Iraq. Uh, instead, he looks at me very seriously. He's about 20. He says, uh, what does life mean to you? And I have to admit that I wasn't quite prepared for that one. So I, I was stammering a little bit, uh, and, and then I stopped and, and gave it some thought, and I said, you know, when I was a young man, I thought life was all about me. How do I make it in the world? How do I become successful? How do I get the things I want? Uh, but now my life revolves around my two little girls. They're not so little anymore. And what I think about is what kind of world am I leaving them? Are we leaving them a country? where there's a huge gap between a few people who are wealthy and a whole bunch of people who are struggling every day? Uh, am I leaving them a country that's still divided by race? A country where, because they're girls, they don't have as much opportunity as boys do? Am I leaving them a country where we're hated around the world because we don't cooperate with other nations? Are we living, uh, leaving them a country that's in grave danger because of what's happening to the planet? And what I've realized is that life doesn't count for much unless you're willing to do your small part to leave our children, all of our children, a better world. Even if it's difficult, even if the work seems great, even if we don't get very far in our lifetime. That's our responsibility as fathers and as parents, to try, to hope. We do what we can to build our house upon the sturdiest rock. And for me, that means building that rock Build, building that house uh, on, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Because, because I'm going to make mistakes, and sometimes it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for me as a father. It's going to be hard for me as a husband. It's hard for me as a public servant. But if I can instill in my children that sense that God is looking out for us, that he's going to be there for us during the darkest hour, that he's going to be there for us no matter what happens, no matter what winds blow, then I know that I can succeed and I know they will succeed. We keep faith that our Father will be there to guide us and watch over us and protect us and lead his children through the darkest storms to a, the light of a better day. And that's my prayer for all of us here on Father's Day. That's my hope for this country in the years to come. And I hope that all of you feel that same faith, that same possibility that I do. Because if we rise up, if we have faith in the Lord, if we're working hard, if we do what we must do as fathers and as mothers, as grandfathers and grandmothers, if we're looking after our children, then I promise you, better days are ahead. God's going to lead us in a bright direction. God is going to lead us in a better direction. God bless you all. Thank you, Apostolic. I appreciate you.
Thank you. Thank you. Pray for me. Pray for Michelle. Thank you. Let us lift up the name of Jesus. Let us lift up the name of Jesus. I want the choir to begin to just sing the song, Trust God Again. As we remain standing, oh, please be seated. Please do not leave the sanctuary. Our worship service is not over. The ones you see, the ones you see leaving are with the Senator's party. I'm going to ask the baptismal committee to come up. Because there may be someone here who there may be someone here who wants to trust in God again. So if there's one who wants to give their life to the Lord, to so open up the doors to the church. Is there one who will say yes to Jesus Christ? It says, I will take responsibility, but I will trust in God first. Is there one? That's the only way you're going to make it. Praise the Lord, my brother. Praise the Lord, my sister, coming down from the I'll take responsibility first, I'll but I'll trust in God. I'll, stand I'll trust in Him first. Is there one more who said yes to the Lord? I'll depend on Jesus. Praise the Lord, my sister. Thank the Lord for each and every one of you. This time, shall we stand? As we reach across the aisle to go into prayer. Take a look at the person sitting next to you, standing next to you. Some you know, some you don't know. But look at them and tell them, I'm going to pray for you. Now look on the other side, tell them, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you. This time, Elder Danny Allen. head in prayer. Precious Father in heaven, we, your people, come to you at the end of this worship service to give you glory, honor, and thanks. We thank you for the speaker you sent to us today. We thank you for his message about building a house on a rock. We ask that you give him great wisdom, knowledge, power, and understanding. We pray that you give him the mind of Christ so that when he speaks, demons will tremble, mountains will be removed, and when the fiery darts of the enemy are flung his way, let the prayers of the saints deflect them and let the world know that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Bless the bishop. Give him supernatural health and strength. Lord, bless our pastor. Bless him from the top of his head to the tip of his toes, Lord. Bless his family, O oh Lord. And Lord, 
Bless this congregation, Lord. Cover it with your blood. Put a hedge of protection around it, Lord. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. My dearly beloved brother, we now baptize you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. My dearly beloved sister, we now baptize you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. My dearly beloved sister, we now baptize you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Dearly beloved brother, we now baptize you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 